Good morning, Eureka. Yes, good morning. How are you? Good. Your mic is working just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Sarah. Would you like to test your mic? Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sure. This is a courtesy announcement that our broadcast is now live on YouTube and our web portal. Good morning, Vice President Ellenberg. Would you like to test your mic? Good morning, Jim. How are you today? I'm good. How about you? Good. Thank you. Have a good day. Going through loud and clear. Thanks. Good morning, Supervisor Simidian. Would you like to test your mic? Good morning. This is Supervisor Simidian staff. He will be joining us in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. And the mic is coming through loud and clear. Thanks. Thank you. Morning, President Wasserman. Good morning, Jim. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How about you? I'm doing all right. Thank you. Doing all right. I see Supervisor Lee. Okay, so we're going to have you up front with your front center. Recording in progress.
We just need a supervisor Chavez and there she is. And 9.30, take it away with a roll call vote, Jim. Hi, Supervisor Nancy, Lee. Nancy, your clerk today. So yeah. she's mm -hmm. going to do roll call for you. I'm sorry, was that Nancy? Yes, it is. Okay, Nancy, roll call for you. Good morning. Supervisor Lee. Good morning, present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. I'm here as well. Thank you. And Supervisor Chavez, I'd like you to lead us in uh, today's Pledge of Allegiance, please. If everyone who can stand, stand. Thank you. Thank you. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Supervisor Chavez. Appreciate that. We now move on to the invocation. And the invocation is brought to us today by Supervisor Lee. Ah, Gabrielle. All right. Supervisor Lee, go ahead with the intro. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. Uh, Gabrielle Antolovich is the board president executive and executive director of Frank LGBTQ Plus Community Center which provides community leadership, advocacy, services, and support to Silicon Valley LGBTQ plus people and their allies. The DeFrank Center has been a pillar of the LGBTQ plus community in Santa Clara County since its opening in 1981, just 12 years after the Stonewall riots in New York City, which helped to start the modern gay rights movement within America. As for the Stonewall, the DeFrank Center started a modest two-room storefront with a group of individuals who were galvanized to action and Santa Clara County residents vote to repeal ordinances that extended housing and employment protections to lesbian and gay men. Since this humbling beginnings that the Frank Center has gone on becoming a gathering place, hosting many discussion groups for many and those identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community, including trans women, trans masculine, gender fluid, non-binary, lesbian, gay, or anyone else who identifies anywhere on the spectrum. Throughout this evolution, Gabriela has always been part of the Frank Center in one way or another. She has been an activist for many years, getting started as a national student organizer in Australia during the 70s, working for equal treatment of gays and lesbians, and later working on substance use prevention in Santa Clara County to help address the high levels of substance use within the LGBTQ plus population, as well as education, outreach on HIV and AIDS. Finally, becoming the executive board president and direct executive director of Billy DeFrank, and while working tirelessly to make sure all individuals have a voice in our society. And with that, I would like to introduce Gabrielle Antolovich to deliver today's invocation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Otto Lee and everybody else here. This is a really difficult time because what we are looking at in November, especially November 20th is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And we are looking at the people who have been murdered for who they are. And as a person who identifies as non-binary, being part of the non-binary trans community, it is a really, really hard time for me personally. Uh, I grew up with parents who wanted a... Uh, ballerina pink tutu girl and at six year old I rejected that and I could feel my mother's love withdrawing from me and I started having panic attacks. A six year old should not have any parent withdrawing from them for being who they are. And so I have a, a special Heart in my heart for transgender people who have been murdered. Uh, this year alone in America, 45 transgender people, trans non-binary people have been murdered. And locally we had a trans woman of color, Natalia Smut, who was murdered here in the in Milpitas, not you know, in our own area. And it's so hard when it kids home, but you know, Trans Day of Remembrance 
is a global movement. We are murdered globally, not just locally. And it is so important, and I applaud our County Board of Supervisors for being so supportive of um, this part of our community. And the Billy DeFrank Center is committed to bringing more resources, more attention, more love to our non-binary transgender folks because of that. And one of the things about the Trans Day of Remembrance we say their names, we show their pictures to make them human. You know, the trans non-binary community has been a political football out there while on the ground, we're being murdered. And quite often law enforcement in different areas are not chasing down the murderers the way they would maybe somebody else. Um, they are not often remembered for who they are. And the attitudes of communities needs to be elevated that everyone matters as a human being. And that is our commitment at the Billy to Frank LGBTQ plus community center. We want to be a microcosm of intersectionality. And, um, and I appreciate being asked to give the invocation that our hearts open to everyone, even if we don't know what it means to be transgender, come to the gathering that is on Saturday, November 20th at 1030 at Grace Baptist Church. Your heart will open just by walking in there, seeing the photographs, knowing that these 45 people were murdered in America alone. America, the land of the free, but not for everyone all the time. And so this is a way of recommitting, you know, who we are as a county that we embrace everyone and not just with our brains and policies, but also with our hearts. And that is um, our wish from, um, as a non-binary person whose mother never loved me again, not just as a six-year-old, but for the rest of her life, because I was not who she wanted me to be. And so our hearts are broken trying to find family with each other. And thank God the County Board of Supervisors is part of our family. I, you know, we really appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, uh, for that invocation on today's agenda. We now move to item number four to announce adjournments in memoriam. Uh, Supervisor Lee, you're up again. Yes, um, today it is with a heavy heart that I offer in German in memoriam for our dear friend and my own mentor, Alameda County Supervisor Wilma Chen. Supervisor Chen was a fierce leader and devoted champion for accessible and affordable health care, child care, housing, immigrant rights, and services for older, older adults for almost 50 years. Born in Boston in 1949 to Chinese immigrant parents, Supervisor Chen received her Bachelor of Arts degree in, the, in history from Wellesley College and a Master of Arts degree in Education Policy from Stanford. She was first elected to the Alameda County Board of Supervisors in 94 and returned in 2010 after serving in the assembly to represent the cities of Alameda, San Leandro, and portions of East Oakland, Chinatown, and Jack London Square. From 2006, she represented Oakland, Alameda, and Piedmont in the State Assembly until being termed out. Over her illustrious 40 plus years of career service in public service, Supervisor Chen was steadfast in her commitment to uplifting community voices and fighting for social and economic justice. Supervisor Chen broke numerous ceilings throughout her career as the first Asian American being elected to Alameda County Board of Supervisors the first woman and first Asian American to be a majority leader 
in the California State Assembly, a true trailblazer and a passionate leader, Supervisor Chen leaves behind a remarkable legacy of groundbreaking policy and community-based initiatives, including saving San Leandro Hospital from closure, preserving the emergency room, saving numerous jobs and protecting safety net hospital in Central County. Founding first five in Alameda County, an Alameda co collaborative for children, youth and their families. Ending the practice of hospitals overcharging uninsured and underinsured patients and to establish a no lead standard in drinking water pipes. Banning toxic flame retardants and putting California on the map as the first state to ban the chemicals and so many, many more. Supervisor Chen is survived by her two children and two grandchildren. Her passing is a tremendous loss to our community and she will sure be sorely missed. But her extraordinary legacy will endure forever. Rest in peace and rest in power, Wilma. Thank you, President Wasserman. Thank you. I'd also like to turn to Supervisor Simidian. You're muted, sir. Thank you. Uh, forgive me, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. There we go, thank you. I just also wanted to add a word of uh, condolence uh, in connection with Wilma Chan's passing, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. I um, uh, had the privilege of uh, being Wilma's colleague. Uh, we were freshmen together uh, when we entered the California State Assembly uh, in the same class some years ago. Um, she was a person of uh, good values, but, but more than that, uh, really great determination and um, uh, a person who uh, was very results oriented in terms of uh, always keeping her eye on um, the end goal and what it would take to improve the lot of people who needed uh, our help uh, most significantly. So I, I add my condolences uh, and um, I know for friends and families, it's a deeply personal loss, uh, but it's also a loss in the sense of um, uh, a person in the public arena who really was determined uh, to make the world a better place for the people who most needed her help. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I wanted to just thank Supervisor Lee for um, having us adjourn in her honor. Um, she was a, you know, role model for many, many, um, many, many, uh, not just elected officials, but activists in our community. And I think what is most, um, what will be most missed is that she was championing issues now that we think of as kind of mainstream when they weren't. And we have to appreciate that courage and tenacity. And um, thank you again, Supervisor Lee. Absolutely. Thank you. That was uh, heartfelt from everybody. We now move on to item number five, commendations and proclamations. And it is my honor to present a commendation for 67 community-based organizations for being instrumental in preventing homelessness by providing direct financial assistance to lower income families during the pandemic. In May of 2020, we're gonna get the screen up there. Good. And we should be having the names of the 67 community-based organizations. There they go. They'll be scrolling by on slides in alphabetical order. In May of 2020, 67 community-based organizations whose names, as I just said, are being displayed on the screen right now. And thank you very much to our clerk's office for making that happen. All these groups work together in an unprecedented collaboration to serve the families and individuals who had little or no access to mainstream relief in Santa Clara County. These 67 community-based organizations stretched and sacrificed their organizational capacity to heroically serve the most vulnerable members of our community throughout the COVID-19 pandemic with empathy, empathy, competency, and accessibility. While of course, each of those individuals were dealing with COVID 
on their own and their families. As part of a collective community response, the organizations rapidly issued emergency financial and rental assistance to the most vulnerable Santa Clara County residents to prevent homelessness and housing instability. These efforts have contributed to the distribution of over $60 million in direct assistance to more than 17,000 families and individuals in Santa Clara County. I now would like to invite Jennifer Loving, the Chief Executive Officer of Destination Home, to say a few words on behalf of the 67 community-based organizations. And Jennifer, we're going to keep that screen going. And if we can please, I don't see you on my little screen. If you are there, I'm Jennifer, here. please start speaking. There you are. Hi, Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. And to the uh, entire Board of Supervisors, thank you for taking the time to honor these 67 organizations that uh, when COVID hit, uh, uh, when everyone else went home, they walked forward right into the middle of this pandemic and worked really truly tirelessly to serve our most vulnerable families. Uh, a, a fraction of these organizations work with our homelessness prevention system historically for the last several years. And we launched a fund to support uh, uh, people affected by COVID uh, within a couple of weeks of shelter in place. That was combined with eviction moratoriums, which made this region and the city of San Jose some of the first in the nation to go into uh, eviction protections for people, vulnerable families. That work together uh, allowed these organizations to serve families, frankly, under their direction. And what I mean by that is uh, we were used to a uh, a subset of people that were becoming homeless every month. Our budget was to serve about 2,000 families in the year 2020. A few weeks into COVID, we'd already gotten 28,000 phone calls for help, 28,000. And so we brought community members under also the direction of Zulma Maciel uh, at the city of San Jose, asked our community what, what was needed and they said money to people as quickly as possible. And so we said, great, can we all do this together? And so all of these organizations joined hands and spent the next many, many months providing first direct cash assistance. And then as finally, there were protections and stimulus money from the federal government to take care of rent. So we started resolving rent and supervisor, actually it's almost $80 million to over wow. 19,000 households um, because only because uh, that's the latest and greatest numbers. Um, and one of the, a couple of the things that I think are worth noting is that the, because we took the direction of these partners and what they knew where the needs were, was the money largely mirrored where the highest uh, impacts of COVID were being felt. The same zip codes that were seeing the enormous rates of transmission, were seeing the largest amounts of resources going into the community at the same time. And as the end result, 95% of the families that received this funding identified as households of color. So all of this was only possible because every one of these names from Gilroy and Palo Alto all the way down to Gilroy and everywhere in between spent and risked their lives to make sure that families could be protected during this pandemic and are still to this day doing this work. So uh, at Destination Home, we are so grateful to our partners. And I also would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge that the team at Destination Home who also uh, pivoted and started doing this work almost exclusively for many months. And then we hired a team of, of temporary employees who are still with us, who are still providing support and resources and, and partner guidance. And we are so grateful to the internal team as well. So thank you for taking the time to acknowledge this amazing group of, of people. Heroes is really the right word. They did not have to do this. And it was for a lot, it risked their lives, it risked their families' lives. And they did it because no one else was going to. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, for all you've done, all you're doing, and thank you to the 67 groups all being listed here. Um, these names are so very recognizable and very much appreciated. And on behalf of this Board of Supervisors, you have our heartfelt thanks for all that you've done and our best wishes that you and your family remain healthy. Thank you very much. With that, we are going to move on to item number five, which is accommodations 
excuse me, we just did item five, accommodations and proclamations. Uh, item A, now we're gonna go to B, C, and D. The first will be brought by Supervisor Lee, and then the last two by Supervisor Ellenberg. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, this one is a commendation um, to Eduardo Rocha. Eduardo Rocha is a District 3 resident and previously served our county as a Santa Clara employee of 30 years with the Department of Probation. So cool. After retirement, Eduardo is now the owner of Silver Spurs, a small hauling and handy man business servicing Santa Clara County and has provided 15 years of extraordinary service to private fiduciaries and the office of the public administrator guardian conservator. Eduardo assisted the public administrator guardian conservator staff in finding clients vital and personal documents, locating and preserving family keepsakes. He is a valued and trusted community partner of the public administrator guardian conservator. Thank you Eduardo for your service and commitment to our public guardian and for going so above and beyond and for so many years. We know that Eduardo is joining us with the public guardian staff and Eduardo, would you like to say a few words? Hi Eduardo, go right ahead. You're muted, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Try again. You are still muted. You might give it a try again. We'll see if the echo has gone away from your uh, partners behind you. Yeah. There you are. I'd like to thank the Board of Supervisors and the Public Guardian's Office for this special award. It's greatly appreciated. You're either a man of few words or you were muted. Yeah, think man a few words, Eduardo. Is there more you would like to say? I'd, I'd also like to comment that it's been a pleasure working uh, with the Public Guardian's Office, a highly professional group dedicated, and uh, I'd like to continue this uh, positive working relationship. I'd like to comment that um, I've got a birthday coming up in a couple of days. So I'm, going be, I'm, I'm going to be 39 years old. And, uh, and uh, we'll see uh, if we can keep this, uh, keep it going on. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very, Thank you very much. And uh, happy early birthday to you from the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. And thank you, Supervisor Lee, for uh, bringing us quite a character. Doing a great and I apologize, job. President Wasserman, I clearly could not add 30 plus 15 is 39. <laughs> that, that's okay. That's okay. We now move on to Supervisor Ellenberg for item 5C. Thank you so much. Um, my first of two proclamations today is in recognition of Transgender Day mm -hmm. of Remembrance. Uh, Gabrielle Antolovich gave a beautiful mm -hmm. invocation this morning. Gabrielle, thank you for sharing mm -hmm. your personal story and the important work that the Billy DeFrank Center does to uplift and support our LGBTQ plus community. Transgender Day of Remembrance will be observed across the country. It's an annual observance on November 20th that honors the memory of the transgender individuals whose lives were lost in acts of anti-trans violence. Tragically, at least 46 transgender or non-gender conforming people were fatally shot or killed by other violent means across the nation in 2021 alone. According to the Human Rights Campaign, these victims were killed by acquaintances, partners, or strangers, some of whom who have been arrested and charged, while others have yet to be identified. Some of the cases involve clear anti-trans bias. In others, the victim's trans status may have put them at risk in other ways, such as forcing them into unemployment, poverty, homelessness, and or survival sex work. Too often, these stories go unreported or misreported. In previous years, most of the people who were killed were Black or Latinx women. These victims are part of our communities. They are partners, family members, friends, colleagues, and members of our faith communities. These losses are horrific, unacceptable, and we must do better. In honor of Transgender Day of Remembrance, the County of Santa Clara Office of LGBTQ Affairs and TransCan Work, Inc. will be presenting Trans Day of Remembrance, the Historical and Human Experience on Thursday, November 18th at 3 p.m. 
panelists of transgender and gender expansive lived experience will speak on their own transgender, non-conforming, non-binary, intersex journeys, sharing stories of personal human experience and discussing the stigma of what it means to be TGI. I hope that many of you will join us for this free virtual event as we amplify the importance of Trans Awareness Week and acknowledge the historical significance of Transgender Day of Remembrance. I'd like to invite our Office of LGBTQ Affairs to read the names of those we've lost. As, as Gabrielle said, it is important that we say their names. Hi, Daniel. Hi, and it, I'm here to uh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Vice President Allenberg. And we want to acknowledge the, the strength, intelligence, persistence, resilience, and extraordinary stories of our trans, non-binary, and gender expansive community members uh, locally and throughout the world. Uh, trans people should not have to stand for the, for the picking and choosing of rights and dignity. And we look forward for the Santa Clara County to continue to push for trans equity, inclusion, and social justice as we honor the legacy of those who fell victim to anti-trans violence by living bravely in their authenticity. Um, we'd like to also uh, acknowledge the trans lives lost um, this year alone, um, this year around uh, 46 trans lives lost, uh, trans lives uh, have uh, lost their lives due to anti-trans violence and brutality. So we'd like to honor them by saying their name. Tiana Alexander, Samuel Edmund Valentin, Bianca Muffin Banks, Dominic Jackson, 50 Bands, Alexis Braxton, China Carilla, Jeffrey JJ Bright, Jasmine Kennedy, Jenna Franks, Diamond Kyrie Sanders, Rihanna Pardo, Jada Peterson, Dominic Luscious, Remy Fennell, Tiara Banks, Natalia Smut, Iris Santos, Tiffany Thomas, Carrie Washington, Jahira Dialto, Whispering Wind Bear Spirit, Sophie Vasquez, Danica Danny Henson, Serenity Hollis, Oliver Ollie Taylor, Thomas Harden, Poe Black, E.J. Boykin, Idaline Evans, Taya Ashton, Shai Vanderpump, Tierra Marie Lewis, Miss Coco, Pooh Don Johnson, Desire Monet, Brianna Hamilton, Pierre Lepri Cartier, Mel Groves, Royal Political Stars, Zoe Rose Martinez, Joe Acker, Jesse Hart, Ricky Otumura, Markeisha Lawrence, and Jenny DeLeon. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you, uh, Vice President Ellenberg. You have a second uh, proclamation as well. I do. And this one is in recognition, recognition of World AIDS Day. Uh, World AIDS Day was founded in 1988 and is an international day dedicated to raising awareness of the AIDS pandemic and honoring the lives lost to that disease. World AIDS Day invites global communities to show support for the estimated 38 million people living with HIV and to honor the more than 36.3 million who have died from an AIDS-related illness. As of 2020, uh, there were 
3,590 people living with HIV in Santa Clara County. The 2021 World AIDS Day Silicon Valley, which is themed Ending the HIV Epidemic, Equitable Access, Everyone's Voice, brings together members of all communities for a series of free, virtual, and in-person public events that provides support and awareness of AIDS-related illnesses. On Wednesday, December 1st, our county's public health department, in partnership with the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, will, rate, will host a flag raising ceremony at 70 West Heading. The flag raising ceremony will be a pillar within a series of county and community driven events happening locally around World AIDS Day to engage and uplift our Santa Clara County community. I'd like to invite members of the county's HIV commission to say a few words now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice President Elleberg. Uh, this is Daniel Moretti from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs. Um, unfortunately, the members of the HIV Commission um, had a schedule conflict or are un unable to make it, but they want to share their extreme gratitude and um, thanks to the Board of Supervisors for their continued recognition of this important day. And they look forward to the opportunity for folks to be together both virtually in person around World AIDS Day on December 1st. Thank you so much to everyone. Thanks, Dan. It's our honor to do so. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, thank you again, Vice President Ellenberg, for bringing this to this board meeting. Before we move on to item number six, receiving our report um, from the annual CalWORKs Achievement Award, I would like to tell anybody listening if they want to speak under public comment, that will be the item following the CalWORKs Achievement Awards, to please register electronically so we have an idea of how many speakers. And a very important reminder today um, is to, if you wish, public comment is to be used to speak about things not on today's agenda. So please do not raise your hand after the CalWORKs award if you wish to speak on anything that is on today's agenda. Thank you. And uh, with that, I will turn to item number six. Robert, do we have you on there? There's Robert. Hey. Hello, good, good morning, good, please. Good morning to everyone. Um, so we have Angela Shing here, a director of Employment Benefits Services, to present this item, and um, we'll let her um, let her go at it here. Thank Great. you. Welcome, Angela. Go right ahead. Thank in. you. Thank you so much. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you so much for um, honoring the accomplishments of our five resilient families um, who, through the determination and perseverance and dedication, have been able to make significant progress towards achieving their goals in our CalWORKs program. Despite uncertainties and challenges resulting from the continued COVID-19 pandemic, these families have certainly persisted and we are thrilled to be celebrating with you and the public to recognize our families for their outstanding achievements. For 31 years, the CalWORKs program has been providing families with services to transition to financial independence. And over the past three decades, the CalWORKs program has expanded in network of community partners and programs so that today we are able to provide a diverse catalog of services designed to meet the needs of each individual family's unique journey. Thanks to the efforts of the employment services teams and community partners, the honorees highlighted in the upcoming video, as well as all of our families have access to a wide variety of individualized employment-based services, including job placement, vocational training, paid work experience, and adult education and community college programs and have been connected to a variety of useful services, including childcare, transportation, food, and healthcare. Today's remarkable honorees demonstrate that having a clear vision, setting attainable goals, and following a well thought out plan can lead to positive and successful outcomes. So on behalf of our staff, families, and community partners, I'd like to wish our award winners continued success. And without further ado, please enjoy this short video we prepared to celebrate our award recipients. Wonderful, thank you. Each year, the CalWORKs program recognizes the outstanding achievements of five CalWORKs families through the CalWORKs Achievement Awards. This year's honorees are particularly notable, having demonstrated the perseverance and determination required to overcome many life obstacles, as well as the challenges of COVID-19, to create a better future for their families. Please join us in honoring this year's CalWORKs Achievement Award winners. Caitlin struggled with many difficult challenges. Now, she has her sights set on becoming a regional manager and owning her first home. Probably just the support I have in, in my support system and in my family. 
Like, they continue to be there. To just keep going back. Like, it's... <sighs> Even if you have to, like, take the bus, like, it's, you know, like, just keep going back <laughs> until you find something, you know, like, you'll get it, you'll get an opportunity and just go with that opportunity. <laughs> yeah. That, like, no matter what obstacle that they, they face, like, as long as they don't give up, like, they'll, they'll be all right, you know, but they can't give up. Erica overcame a difficult situation to set out on a journey to provide a safe and stable environment for her two daughters. She has worked as a disaster service worker for the county at the fairgrounds and has maintained economic stability since May. So basically when I went to the fairgrounds, I, was, I wasn't I was too pleased about it, but I was like, you know what, this is for a good cause, you know, I'm going to be a part of it, I'm going to be, you know, one of those people later in life saying, I was there, I was doing that, I helped, you know, so I thought it was a good positive on that part. I feel like the opportunity of being in the program and having the job, it helped me support my family, you know. Well, if they're in the program, I would highly suggest learning and taking everything you can in um, and just like doing your best so you can show and stand out. Um, because if I can do it, I know they can do it. Anybody can do it. And just to work for the county is something, it's, it's an opportunity. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity, you know. So I think it takes time and patience to get where you want to be. Maria's focus has always been to provide a safe and stable home for her family. Her long-term goals are to become a citizen, establish herself within a stable and good-paying career, and to purchase a forever home for her family. My life has a good because uh, the program hard work helped me, helped me for the English class, helped me for the money, helped me for take care for my kids. It's a good. It uh, has a good in my life. Was there ever anything you wanted me to do for you, but I could not? No, no means you and other people help me. Mohammed and Samar's journey has not been easy. Rather, it has been long and challenging. Mohammed and Samar are grateful to CalWorks for the opportunities and resources that have made it possible for them to pursue their dreams. Is there anything that you would be most grateful for? Um, so the things that I'm... In grateful in life first of all uh, they're obviously my kids uh, I I'm very proud of them and really grateful for have them in our lives and now you've been part of the um, CalWORKs program um, since you moved here to Santa Clara County um, what um, since you've been enrolled in the program um, how has it changed your life uh, uh, well, uh, it, first of all, it gives us uh, a peace of mind that, uh, like I uh, mentioned earlier, that there is help around the corner uh, if we ever need it. And uh, and then we were, uh, my wife and I both were able to focus on study and to, uh, to better plan for a better future of our family. So uh, it's been a great help in getting us resources, uh, uh, Make making resources available for us, so it's it's been great. Now, for for future generations of your family, um, uh, watching this video, what is something? What are some words of wisdom you would like to give them? What would you like them um, to know? Uh, well, um, first, love each other and care for each other because that's 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 what matters the most. Sonia's hard work and perseverance attracted the notice of one of her instructors, who offered Sonia an internship with the Santa Clara County Office of the District Attorney. What are some of the most important lessons that you have learned in life? Uh, the most important lesson that I've learned in my life is that never give up. Achieve your goals where you are and just don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. What are you most grateful for in your life? 
I am so grateful for the people that are around me, my family, my kids. I'm grateful uh, for the CalWorks. I think I wouldn't have been here if it wasn't that help that I received. So I'm so grateful for the people, everybody who has helped me around the CalWorks. Congratulations to our awardees for everything you and your families have overcome. We look forward to your continued growth and future success. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Congratulations to everyone. I look forward to the days when we get to see all your faces and your families and your friends and your specifically your CalWork um, supporters there in our board chambers in person again. Look forward to doing that next year. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much, supervisors. I always say the facts and figures tell part of the story, but me being able to see the, the, um, the awardees faces Yes. Um, truly tells a story, and I appreciate your, your recognition of that so much. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you, Robert, as well. All right, with that, we're going to move on to item number seven, which is public comment. Everybody listening who wants to speak under public comment, please understand that items 11 and 12, which relate to the jail topic, will not be heard today and are being deferred to the January 11th meeting. Um, and I'm guessing at 2 p.m. We'll firm that up at the end. But right now, it's my intent to hear those items, which are on today's calendar, number 11 and 12, regarding the jail, jail system. We're going to hear those on January 11th at 2 p.m. So if that's what you want to speak about today, there's no need for you to do so. It does not come under public comment, and we will not, we will not be hearing it today. With that, um, I'm going to turn to our clerk, Nancy, and I'm going to ask you to read the consent calendar, please. OK. There is a correction to item number 9B. Item number 9B is to consider recommendations relating to the purchase and ground lease of real property located at 3090 South Bascom Avenue, San Jose property, assessor's parcel number 414-14-092. The delegation listed in, in the second possible action should allow for a contract term not to exceed 75 years. There is a request from Vice President Ellenberg to hold item numbers 11 and 12 to January 11, 2022, following consideration by the Public Safety and Justice Committee. Apologies. Item number 11. Nancy, apologies. Um, yes. I we skipped public comments. Super, uh, President Wasserman, procedurally, I believe we need to do that first. You're saying doing doing public comment before the um, consent calendar. You are 100% right. I thank you for that, Jim. And uh, let's do that. I made all those disclaimers about public comment and then forgot all about it. Call me a rook for a day. It's all right, sir. So Nancy, we'll go to uh, calling the folks for item uh, for the public comment item. Yep, and let's look at number of participations. We currently have five, six. Okay, seven. Let's just give it a minute here for all those people thinking I skipped right over them. Okay, let's go. I see we have seven. Let's go with two minutes each. Our first speaker is Sarah Clay Smutnik. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The and timer before, will start when you begin and, speaking. And before you start her time, I want to thank the 23 people who texted me that I forgot public comment. Thank you all very much for having my back. All right, let's start. Sarah, you may begin. Okay, um, my name is Sarah Clay. I work for Santa Clara County Parks. I 
am currently stationed on the grounds crew. Uh, we take care of approximately 200 acres of lawns throughout the county. And uh, we are a specialized crew who does the mowing, irrigation repairs, uh, fertilizing, slit seeding, uh, fixing water breaks. Uh, we completed the irrigation technician training cl class, which is a 40 hour course. <clears throat> the regular 60 park staff who usually cleans the bathrooms and takes care of the group areas um, will have to go through the irrigation technician training, uh, which in my opinion um, is a waste of taxpayers money. And uh, so, our uh, crew is uh, trained to operate uh, smart uh, controllers. Um, but since we are in a drought, we want to uh, try to save as much water as possible as far as the um, lawns go. So um, yeah, so they want to get rid of our crew, unfortunately, and uh, put all the extra uh, workload um, on top of the regular park staff at all the parks. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, Supervisor. Good morning. Paul, we can't hear you. It was March that Chicanos represented 5% Mexicans, represented 5% of the population, but yet we represented 20% of the casualties in Vietnam. On August 29th of 1970 in Los Angeles, we marched against that. We petitioned, we were rejoicing our grievance to the government and stating that this is unjust, that they are sending our men, or they were taking us from the fields of Vietnam, from Sasipuedes and putting them in the fields of Vietnam. And we were fighting for their democracy. We were fighting to give them a democracy that the Chicanos were not experiencing here in San Jose. These are facts, okay? And the process that was gone, undergone in order to set that monument over that history park, I wanna know why the public was not notified of that. Why the public was not educated about Vietnam, Vietnamese placing that statue there in commemoration and then having them talk like the Americans had abandoned them. They said that the Americans abandoned them and there are Chicanos in this city that died on their behalf. And the Mexicans in California marched in that Chicano moratorium against what the government was doing. As a result of that, we lost three people. One of them was reporter Ruben Salazar, who was considered the voice of the people. And he was a reporter for the LA Times and he was killed in the, in the Silver Dollar Bar by the Sheriff's Department. They blew his head off with a, with a gas, uh, uh, like a gas grenade. And so what I'm saying is that I don't have any objections about having it, but the process that you guys undergone is cause for suspicion. I mean, you're putting up a monument that is a representative of war and you ain't even talking about the Mexican community here that sacrificed their best for them. Our next speaker is Linda Edwards. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. 20 months ago, you asked us to shut down our society, to flatten the curve, to save our healthcare system, and we did, negatively impacting so many people's jobs and businesses, but we did because you said it was for the greater good. And you asked us to endure more lockdowns and restrictions to reach herd immunity to save the elderly and immunocompromised. But now, after looking at data from around the world, we know that there will be no herd immunity because these vaccines do not provide immunity. They do not stop person-to-person -person transmission, and their effectiveness against severe disease wanes within months, requiring never-ending boosters. It doesn't matter if it's the Delta variant, Mu, Nu, Omega, Sigma, or Xanadu. We will continue to have variant after variant after variant. It is now time to treat COVID like the endemic virus that it is, just like the seasonal flu. We have to learn to live with it. Norway has opted to open fully. 
no masks, no vaccine mandates, no vaccine passports. And that was with lower vaccination rates than Santa Clara County. Many of our surrounding counties have opted to reduce the mask mandates for indoor masking, including Santa Cruz County, Alameda County, Marin, Contra Costa, and others. But here in Santa Clara County, we're approaching record 85% single vaccinated rates and over 73% for fully vaccinated. And you want to keep masks indoors, masking for kids, and forcing people to choose between their jobs and forced vaccination. Stop the insanity. Stop focusing on COVID case rates, which we know from past experience are inaccurate faulty PCR tests and many false positives. We talked about this months ago, remember? Instead, we need to focus on hospitalization rates and deaths. Both of those rates are low in our county. Let's talk about early in-home treatment kits like they're doing in parts of India. Let's get IV monoclonal antibody clinics like they're doing in Florida and other states. Let's get widespread antibody testing to see what our natural immunity rates are. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melissa Ortiz. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Melissa Ortiz and I've been a park maintenance worker with Santa Clara County Parks for four years now. Um, as a park maintenance worker, my coworkers and I kept our parks open during the whole of the pandemic. We provided an essential public ser service when it was needed most. And I'd like to talk today about the parks management's proposal to delete a senior park maintenance worker and the reorganization of our grounds crew. We're concerned because management proposal, one, eliminates one of our few promotional opportunities, two, lowers the quality of service that we deliver to the public, and three, disregards a petition signed by over 90% of park maintenance workers. Uh, a month ago, our membership made three different proposals to management with no reply. Yesterday, we met with management and they told us they still didn't have a reply for us. Even after 90% of park maintenance workers signed a petition against the job deletion. Uh, we do this work to serve the community and make the parks a safe and fun place to be. And we're proud of the jobs that we do. We ask the board to urge management to please negotiate in good faith with SEIU 521 and save our promotional opportunities. Our community deserves better. Thank you. The next speaker is Linda Bookman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. My name is Linda Bookman. I've lived in the county for 25 years. I'm a mother, a public health nurse, and for the last year and a half, I've been a volunteer for the public health department working at vaccination clinic. I would like to publicly thank Dr. Cody for her leadership during this pandemic. And I would like to publicly thank you, the Board of Supervisors, for supporting her and the whole public department. Thank you. The next speaker is Matthew Silva. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Matthew Silva. I've been a park maintenance worker with Santa Clara County Parks for seven years. During the pandemic, our park stayed open and provided an essential public health service that would not have been possible without park maintenance workers. Uh, I'd also like to talk to you today about our management's proposal to delete a senior park maintenance worker position, as well as our turf and irrigation maintenance crew. Um, again, we would like to urge the board or ask the board to urge parks management to please negotiate in good faith with SEIU 521 and to save our promotional opportunities and to allow us to maintain the standard of excellence that the public expects from us when they visit our parks. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Scott Largent. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Santa Clara County, Scott Largent. I'm uh, taking a little drive before I um, head out to work. And I'm over near uh, Bellarmine High School. And uh, some of these neighborhoods over here, uh, they had minimal uh, amount of RVs kind of throughout the pandemic. But now every single spot now is a car, a motor home. And then, of course, the sidewalks now are starting to pile up with tents and um, lo lots of people. Um, this is the other direction that everyone was pushed out of that crash zone. Um, the rest of everybody is over there now in zone one. I believe there's zone one there. 
And those ones are all along the Guadalupe, uh, right backed up against 87. Um, I, I wave the flag. Um, I, I try to get you guys involved to do something about this humanitarian crisis. Um, people are not being put on the correct holds right now. They're being allowed to just wander in traffic and setting it as that's their baseline now is just unacceptable. Uh, there's a man, his name is uh, Rainbow. Uh, he, he's had a rough life and we're watching this man die over the period of the last three years. Um, he is now in a set of pumps right now. He looks dead. He just literally looks like the walking dead. And he's going across Taylor, across Coleman. You know, he's convulsing. He doesn't know which direction to go. And um, the county doesn't seem to think that's a problem. The police department doesn't seem to think that's a problem. Um, this is somebody's child, you know, that needs to be pulled out of this type of situation, put on a hold, stabilized, and, and truly helped. And everyone has seen this person out there. And, and um, they're, they're damn near dead. And that's unacceptable. So um, get off Zoom and get out here and take a look, please. Next speaker is Elizabeth. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. And um, I want to talk about like, so before um, the pandemic, we had a lot of folks who are homeless in Santa Clara County, over 11,000 folks who are homeless. And so I'm hearing the, all the statistics about um, the many people who are be, uh, being helped throughout the pandemic, which is really great, but we still have this unprecedented amount of people who are homeless um, and need re resources and need help. And having a new jail would not help that. It would just cycle people um, um, through the jail and not really help them um, with what they need help with. So I'm saying no to the new jail and yes to helping people who uh, are homeless and actually get um fundamental the fundamental resources that they need thank you the next speaker is gail ann osmer i am unmuting you please accept the unmute to begin speaking hi good morning um i just wanted to get on and talk about the rv problem that we're having and um our unhoused folks not having any place to go but like Scott said, um, near Bellamon on the streets. Yesterday, I went to get my booster at the fairgrounds and I, we had to go on Monterey in the back there. And on the way out, I mean, I was amazed at this land that is empty. There's fences around there. I, I just can't comprehend why we can't put hundreds of RVs out there. This land is just sitting there. And um, I just wish that this could happen um, in phase three um, during this whole FAA um, abatement. A lot of the RVs are on that side, phase three, which is Taylor, Spring, Irene heading. And um, they need to be moved because there's so many people living so close to each other. So um, I really truly believe that we can find a way to move these RVs out there. Please look into this. It's very important and it's very important for people's lives. Um, I know living in an RV is much better than living outside, but still they need to be safe. And where the folks are, unfortunately in phase three, they are not safe. So thank you so much. I do appreciate your time. And I really hope we can you can look into this and see what we can do or you can do. So let's move some of these RVs out there. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. And with that, we're gonna proceed in numerical order and move on to the consent calendar. All right, so Nancy, if you uh, will please read our consent calendar again. There is a correction to item number 9B. Item number 9B is to consider recommendations relating to the purchase and grand lease of real property located at 3090 South Bascom Avenue in San Jose, property assessor's parcel number 414-14-092. 
the delegation listed in the second possible action should allow for a contract term not to exceed 75 years. There is a request from Vice President Ellenberg to hold item numbers 11 and 12 to January 11, 2022, following consideration by the Public Safety and Justice Committee. Item number 11 is to receive report relating to improving jail management and operations, appropriately sizing the jail population and alternatives to jail. Item number 12 is to consider recommendations relating to the framework for justice involved clients. There is a request from Supervisor Chavez to hold item number 21 to December 14th, 2021. Item number 21 is to receive report relating to next steps for the countywide analysis of schools and post-secondary institutions, compliance with Title IX, the Clary Act, and other relevant state and federal laws. There is a request from Supervisor Lee to add item number 22 to the consent calendar. Item number 22 is to consider recommendations relating to home ownership programs and updates to the 2016 affordable I'm sorry, 2016 Measure A Affordable Housing Bond Guidelines. There is a request from administration to hold item number 24 to December 7, 2021. Item number 24 is to consider recommendations relating to a challenge grant to fund the development of supportive interim housing sites across the county. There is a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item numbers 42, 43, 48, 51, 55, and 57 from the consent calendar. Item number 42 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 93 in the amount of $138,850 transferring funds from the COVID-19 and other economic uncertainty reserve to the Department of Correction budget relating to adding an unclassified administrative services manager three position to support the chief of correction. Item number 43 is the adoption of executive leadership salary ordinance number NS-20.21.07, adding one unclassified administrative services manager three position in the department of correction. Item number 48 is to receive report relating to market research for a new solicitation process for jail, phone, and tablet services. Item number 51 is to receive report relating to School of Arts and Culture's efforts to undertake affordable housing and community development. Item number 55 is to approve delegation of authority to the county executive or designee to negotiate, execute, amend, or terminate pre-development agreements such as exclusive negotiating agreements and pre-development loan agreements with Eden Housing and the core companies or their affiliates in connection with the planning of and pre-development loans for a potential multifamily affordable housing development of approximately seven acres of property owned by the county known as the East Santa Clara Street Site in San Jose. Item number 57 is to consider recommendations relating to the safe parking program for unhoused vehicle dwellers. There is a correction to item number 68. The item should read as follows. Item number 68, Supervisor Lee nominate. Janet Payne for appointment to the Race and Health Disparities Community Board, seat number 10. There is a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item numbers 69, 70, and 71 from the consent calendar to be considered concurrently. Item number 69 is to re receive report relating to the draft juvenile justice realignment block grant annual plan. Item number 70 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 82 in the amount of $1,032,405 increasing revenue and expenditures and adjusting reimbursements within the probation department and behavioral health services department budgets relating to the juvenile justice realignment block grant program funding. Item number 71 is to ratify the attestation form for the County of Santa Clara signed by the County Executive and submitted to the California State Controller's Office Local Government Programs and Services Division relating to the juvenile justice realignment block grant program funding. 
This concludes the reading of the consent calendar update. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna make one comment on 21, and then I'm gonna to turn to Supervisor Chavez, who has a number of items that are pulled. Just a heads up, Supervisor Chavez, um, who has a number of items pulled and asked if there's um, anything we could do about those as far as grouping them together or comments that you may have to get Mike, them- Mike, I'm ready to go on it. Thank you to get them back on to consent or approve. Oh, some of them, yeah. The comment I'm going to make on item number 21 is when it comes back to us from the consultants um, identifying the problems that they find, that I also expect solutions to be provided. Um, again, my position on this item was why are we doing this work for the schools? At the end of the day, when they get this information, I hope our consultants not only identify the problems at each site, and I'm sure there are problems at each site, they also come back with the recommended solutions, and then we hand the ball over to the schools to take it from there. Uh, that was my only comment. With that, Supervisor Chavez, I'm gonna to turn to you um, regarding the items that you pulled. Thank you. I wanna first um, start with item 18. This is an item, uh, a report back on a referral I made relative to drug facilitated sexual assault. I wanted to thank the staff for the very thorough um, staff report and ask for a six month report out to the full board regarding implementation as it relates to all hospitals in the county. On item, um, on items both 11 and 12, I. Um, appreciate the direction to hold those to January 11th. I'm supportive of that. Item number 22, I'd like to leave it off um, consent and to have it be heard at its regular position in the agenda. Supervisor Chavez, I need clarification, please. On item 18, I heard your comments and your requests, but we are still hearing 18. Consent. Consenting 18, thank you. Correct. And on 22, it was being held, your request? No, it was being heard today instead of being put on consent. I have requests from Supervisor Lee to add item 22 to consent. Your desire yes. is that it be heard. Correct. Thank you. Item 42 and 43 relate to um, hiring a, an, um, an administrative service manager to support the chief of correction. I'd like to put item 42 and 43 back on consent, but with direction to staff to come back to the full board, either in open or closed session as is appropriate to discuss the hiring of a chief of correction. Already. Item 48 is to receive a report from the office of the county executive and our procurement officer in the office of the sheriff and TSS relating to market research for a new solicitation process for jail phones and tablets. I want to thank the staff for the work done on this. I'd like to put it back on consent and request that procurement through the county exec consider an annual um, mini market survey to see if there are new technologies that become available. All right. item, item 49 is on the consent calendar. This is in response to a request that I made to better understand how we were utilizing state and federal funds, primarily state funds for the expansion of housing. I'd like to ask staff to come back to FGOC at its January meeting with a timeline and a work plan attached to the report back. Okay. Item 51 is uh, to receive a report from the office of the county exec related to the School of Arts and Culture. I'd like to ask if my colleagues are comfortable with me deferring that to December 14th. Item 55 um, is to um, this is to approve a delegation of authority um, on a site that the county owns on Santa Clara and 17th. 
I want to remind the staff that the board has asked repeatedly for more community engagement. I am concerned that we have chosen a develop, actually the development companies without educating the, the community about our process and about the um, choice and why it was made. I would like to leave it on consent, but move that there be a communication with the community in December, a Zoom, uh, uh, a Zoom presentation explaining where we are in the process and addressing any and all community concerns relative to the communication process specifically. Item 57, this is to approve an amendment with Amigos de Guadalupe relating to the safe parking services. Colleagues, the reason I asked for this to be pulled out is that you may recall that Supervisor Otto Lee and I brought forward a request for examination for expansion of safe parks. And actually, Supervisor Allenberg, you asked us to even look in your community as well. I wanted to make sure that the Amigos de Guadalupe were um, included in that search process and that there would be flexibility, if necessary, to provide, um, uh, to partner with current service providers for these new locations. I had an opportunity to discuss that with Dr. Smith and he assured me that would be the case. So I will put it on consent, asking staff to make sure that occurs. And those are all of my changes. Thank you very much, Suraj Chavez. Okay, for everybody following at home, and Nancy, that means you in particular, we have those changes. Do we have any other comments? I see no other hand. I see a hand raised by Vice President Ellenberg. Please go right ahead. Thank you so much. Um, just a, a couple um, items on uh, 52 uh, regarding the COVID uh, recovery activities. I appreciate the report. There are just three items I'd like to highlight for follow up, please. Uh, and it can stay on consent. Uh, first, in the discussion of the access and function needs and multi agency coordination group, I didn't see disability rights partners on the list of stakeholders. Um, and would like to make sure that uh, we, we coordinate with the team that's building out the Office of Disability Affairs to identify partners for that, please. Uh, second, now that the City of San Jose is making progress on their recovery priorities, I'd like to request uh, that a future quarterly report include areas of city and county partnership or coordination. And third, I'm very glad to see that there's progress in filing the additional public health infrastructure uh, positions. I do remain concerned about sustainability, though, of those positions after uh, the grant ends in about a year. So I'd like to request that a status report on federal, state, or local resources to extend these positions uh, be included in the mid-year and annual budget discussions this year. I just want to confirm that all of that is clear to administration. Dr. Smith. I'm sorry, we're having yeah. a problem here. Can you repeat the last part of it? Sure. The third, um, it, it was first an acknowledgement that I'm glad, very glad to see that there's progress in filling the additional public health infrastructure positions, but I'm concerned about how we sustain those positions um, after the grant ends. So I want to request that a status report on federal, state, and local resources to extend these positions be included in the mid-year and the annual uh, budget discussions this year. Will do. Great, thank you so much. And uh, just a quick comment on item 65 regarding the um, Board of Supervisors uh, meetings that have been scheduled. I, I have raised uh, these concerns with the, with the clerk of the board and I fully understand their reluctance to make changes to a very complicated schedule or schedule back-to-back -back meetings. But I just wanted to note that the September 27th proposed meeting date falls on the second day of Rosh Hashanah and the October 4th meeting falls on the eve of Yom Kippur. I am only one of five supervisors and frankly, I have the prerogative to say that I won't attend a meeting on the 27th and that I'll need to leave by 3 p.m. on the 4th. But I was thinking about 
Jewish County staff members who may not enjoy that flexibility and who may be expected to prepare for a board meeting on the first day of the Jewish New Year and attend a meeting on the second. Um, I know that we stand for equity and we celebrate diversity and I know that living in a very diverse county presents challenges along with many, many, many benefits. But I think that acknowledging the conflicts and trying our best to work around them is important. I want to be clear that I'm not asking for a change for 2022, but would ask that the Jewish High Holidays be taken into consideration when scheduling meetings going forward. Thank That's you. all Thank I have. You. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to ask that items 73 and 74 <clears throat> come off the consent calendar. Uh, I've given uh, the appropriate staff a heads up that I have a couple of questions, and I think those are my only requests uh, now that we've made our way through the consent calendar. All right, thank you very much. See no other hands. Nancy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you just to confirm the items that have now been um, removed. I would start with item number 11, item 12, item 18, item 21, item 24, and then we will hear item 73 and 74 um, under item 25. Do you concur? I also have 6970 and 71. Did I? That's correct. And Supervisor Chavez, you, you still have 6970 and 71 to be heard together. That's correct. And item 22 also. And oops, let me flip back to item 22 is being heard. That Yes, I, I've got that one on there. Supervisor Simidian? Thank you. I'm not sure I heard 7374, which was the yes. request I made just a moment ago. I'll, yes, and yes. then you you mentioned 18, Mr. Chair, but I believe it's being added to consent rather than removed from consent. That's correct. Thank you. It's being added to consent. Right. The numbers I listed first were not going to be heard under the regular schedule, but thank you for the clarification. Item 16 is being approved under consent. And the items that will be heard under 25, items previously removed from the consent calendar, are 6970 and 71 together per Supervisor Chavez, and then 70 and 74 per Supervisor Submitian. Nancy, how does that sound? And thank you, Peters, for the correction. And forgive me, Mr. Yes. Chairman, I, I, it's 73 and 74 are yes. the two that I've asked to remove. Yes. And, and I may have misheard on the computer, but I think you said, item 16 when you meant item 18 uh, being added to consent. Item 18 is, yes, added to consent. 16 stays as is. And again, the items under 25 will be 69, 70, 71, 73, and 74. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Nancy, how does that sound to you? That sounds great. That's what I have. Okay, so with that, I, I'll make the motion to approve the consent calendar and changes as has been detailed. Do I have a second? Second by Chavez. And I just wanted to um, reinforce what Supervisor Ellenberg said on item 65 around our calendar and would like to see that ad addressed in the coming year. Thank you. It's, um, it, it's certainly a significant issue and I also appreciate Supervisor El Vice President Ellenberg bringing up the, the respect of other um, religions and entities as, as well. It's a tough thing to do in scheduling, but that's certainly something we will look at, absolutely. So we've got a motion and a second, no further hands. Nancy, take a vote quick, please. Would you like to take public comment before we do the vote? On, <laughs> boy, I'm really not on my game today. Thank you. Yes, we'll have public comment, and um, we'll we'll do two minutes each. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, 
Francisco from the Horseshoe. Um, it's all right, uh, Supervisor Wasserman. I'm I'm Mexican. I'm from San Jose. We're we're used to it. We're used to uh, uh, being ignored by both county and city governments. And there's been a, a a history of that in this city. My comments are restricted to uh, land use issues and the failure for both the county and the city to use the redlining maps to determine uh, districting issues, okay? Because those redlining maps affected those decisions that we're like dealing with today. Secondly is school allocations, resources for those schools, park deficits, uh, infrastructure uh, investments. You know, we have an infrastructure bill coming in and, and that was passed. So there's, there's going to be billions of dollars coming to this area. Okay, and when we neglect to use that redlining map with respect to land usage, land purchases, and how do we counterbalance the generational impacts of the deprivations that that redlining map created? I don't know if anybody on this council has read the documents. I have, I have them. And they were produced, they weren't produced by the uh, federal government. They were produced by city and county employees. And by creating those maps, it sustained a lot of the systemic and institutionalized racism that we're dealing with today. So to look at a particular issue today with respect to poverty, um, schools, or housing, and not see it through the lens of that redlining map and its generational consequences, I think is very irresponsible because you'll never get to what equity really means when you don't acknowledge that. Thank you. Next speaker is Scott Largent. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, kind of cut out of work to uh, hop in the car and uh, do a quick, uh, quick hauler out and begging for uh, safe parking programs. You guys have uh, several items on here on the consent calendar to get today um, involving increasing the money that's going to these nonprofits. Um, I'm still trying to find the unicorn. Where, where is the magical safe parking programs? Uh, I, I, I can't find them. I can't find them for people that are sober. I can't find them for seniors. I can't find them for the disabled. I can't find them for women escaping domestic violence. Uh, where are they? And it's obvious since everybody is packed, jam packed in that field and all the way around Bellarmine, we, we know where they're at. I, I think, well, this is a humanitarian disaster. I, I'm asking for you guys to act. I need a board of action right now. I think it's, uh, I think it's time to open up the fairgrounds right now and, and take this thing seriously. <laughs> Seeing this unfold firsthand is shocking. Pregnant women getting COVID using one portage on for hundreds of people, uh, that, that, that is shocking. Women having babies in trailers is unbelievable. Women escaping domestic violence out there. Uh, the mentally ill just doing things that are the most bizarre stuff you've ever seen in your entire life. Um, it's time. It's, it's been time like years ago. Um, get off of Zoom. OK, get in your nice, fancy Mercedes Benzes and drive down the street and see this. Some of you elected officials have made your way out there because I gave you the tour. OK, the rest of you, it, it, it's more than time. Please do something. Come in. Sorry about that. Had myself muted. Next Thanks, speaker yeah. is Molly M. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Molly McLeod, and I want to um, thank Supervisor Ellenberg for um, the statements and observation about item 52, access and functional needs, and the importance of making sure that disability-led and disability-serving organizations are um, included in the planning process as well as people with disabilities and appreciate very much the linkage to the um, future Office of Disability Affairs. Just stating the words disability and connecting it with 
the, the county is making that awareness grow deeper about the connections to the work that needs to be done. Um, I've been participating on the access and functional needs um, county's sub working group led by Silicon Valley Independent Living Center um, for the last two years. And one thing that I uh, did recently was a public records request to all of the jurisdictions in the county. And um, amazingly, um, there are parts of the county that don't know that there's any obligation to include people with disabilities in the planning and in fact have no responses. I'm gonna be following up sharing the information that I collected with uh, each of the supervisors. My hope is that by next um, November for the Golden Eagle exercise, that people with disabilities will be included in the planning so that when the big earthquake hits, when there are multiple catastrophes and disasters, the lives of those who are disabled are not left behind and left for dead. And I think we're um, along the way of making progress. And again, wanna express my appreciation to the supervisors who have unanimously voted to prioritize um, disability awareness and a deeper learning. Thank you. Thank you. And Nancy, before you proceed, Supervisor Chavez, I just noticed your hand was up. Did you wanna make a comment before we hear from the rest of the speakers? Nope, you're good. Thank you. Nancy, please continue. Next speaker is Alex Shore. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. I wanted to speak on item 55. Is that still on consent? Yes. Okay, great. Well, a, a quick note. It is pretty difficult. I'm sure you've heard this feedback before, supervisors, to track all the items in real time that are getting removed and keeping on consent. And you all know I used to work for the Board of Supervisors, so if it's hard for me, it must be even harder for some other folks in the public. And I, I'm just wondering if the clerk's office or a supervisor, perhaps through a referral, could consider a way to display this information in real time so us as community members could be able to track this a little bit easier and figure out whether we're going to be getting the joy of spending our day with you or if an item is being deferred and we might be able to revisit you in the future. Uh, wanted to check in on item 55. This is a site that Catalyze SV members care a lot about. We have already had our members evaluate the housing authorities part of the site, and we are excited to see affordable housing in this part of town and this site, both from the housing authority and hopefully it sounds like today moving forward from the county as well. We do want to note that the RFQ talks about the goal is to maximize the supportive and ELI units on subject sites. And we have seen, including projects you'll be hearing again later today, uh, developers in the face of some community opposition, uh, reducing the number of homes, decreasing the heights. And that is something our members do not want to see. We want to see as much affordable housing built as possible. So the, ref, uh, the item also talks about District 2 and the Housing Authority coordinating ongoing outreach efforts in connection with the Santa Clara Street site. I think our members would enjoy scoring this proposal from core companies and Eden Housing to good affordable housing developers. So I'll be following up with Supervisor Chavez's office to see if uh, that's something we can do as well as with our, our dedicated housing staff. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Our next speaker is Tina Brown. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, this is Tina Brown and I am a system impacted family member with Silicon Valley Debug and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I'm calling in to show support and thank Supervisor Ellenberg's request to holding and moving items 11 and 12. The report is vague and incomplete. It disregards the community input and most importantly, leaves out the voices of those community members caged up inside our county jails, which defeats the purpose of their participation as being a vital and driving force of the process. There must be some further explanation given as to why the county executive's response is entertaining the idea of building a max security jail after the murder of Michael Tyree, numerous hunger strikes, huge lawsuit payouts, multiple COVID-19 outbreaks, and the board's previous declaration to eliminate systemic and institutional racial inequities. This recommendation is outright racist 
It's insulting and a slap in the face to those with lived experience and for those that are working very hard to bring positive change in this space. I thank you for my time, for your time. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that and all those that spoke. Um, we'll now please call for a vote. We have a motion by Wasserman, a second by Chavez. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Supervisor Samidian? He's muted at the moment. Why don't you continue? We'll come back to him. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. And Supervisor Samidian? All right, he might have stepped away. Let's move on to item number nine, Nancy. And uh, item number nine is a public hearing to consider the purchase of real property at 3090. Oh, we may have Supervisor Smithian. Supervisor, forgive me, I was muted. I, I'm an I vote. Thank you. So we have a 5 0 um, unanimous approval of the consent calendar as revised. We now move on to item number nine a public hear hearing to be heard no earlier than 10 o'clock. It is now 11 o'clock, so we've handled that. I'm going to open the public hearing. And I'm going to turn to Consuelo and who I see here, and Mr. Jeffrey Draper, who may or may not be here. Consuelo, if you can hold just a minute, I'm going to open the public hearing here. And Nancy, if you'll please recognize our speakers, and they can have one minute each. First speaker is Alex Shore. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Alex, can you Hello. please mute? Oh, there you go. Hey, this is Alex Shore, Executive Director of Catalyze SV again. Our members actually had a chance to score this project, 3090 South Bascom, uh, er earlier this year and scored it a 3.83 out of five which means we would like to see it go forward. It, it scored well on some of the community engagement uh, aspects. Um, we did wonder a little bit about if we could make it a little bit more vibrant. Uh, the commercial space is a little small, our members felt. And we also were wondering about the intensity zoning. The item on your agenda talks about the reduced heights of the project. Uh, Catalyze SV members were very supportive of higher heights and more homes. Uh, if something is going to be an investment of the county of this much money, we believe the county should continue to push for projects that will build as many homes as possible. And we are supporting this action today from the county soups. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe again. The uh, redlining maps, um, when we're talking about equity and we're talking about um, um, dealing with, you know, systemic institutionalized racism that we, we identify generally, but there's the specificity of how that manifests in our community over generations, that piece has not been articulated, but yet we're making decisions and we're saying that we uphold these particular principles and we acknowledge that these systems have impacted Chicanos, they've impacted Blacks, they've impacted uh, uh, the Asian community. The, when we say that and we don't go to where the root, the modern root of that, which is the red line map, then we're doing a disservice to the very people that we say that we're applying those principles of equity, inclusion, and diversity. And so those headlines. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Thank you. So I opened the public hearing and we received uh, public testimony. I am now closing the public hearing. Consuelo, we have you here. Do you have a report or are you here for questions from the board members, which will start off with Supervisor Chavez? Consuelo, do you have anything to uh, say first? 
Uh, good morning, Board President Wasserman and members of the board. Just wanted to share uh, three points. Um, the project did receive its full entitlements in February 2021, following some intensive um, community engagement. On August 11th, they secured all of the necessary financing, including a tax credit allocation. Um, and then the construction is scheduled to begin in February 2022. And happy to take any questions. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, and um, wow, well done. That's very fast. So thank you for all that and working so closely with the community as well. Um, I just had one question and it had to do with the length of the delegation of authority. It, it has it through um, 2026. And what's curious to me about that, especially given the fast track this is on, um, why, why do we have the delegation of authority over such a long period of time? Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. We allow for enough time to convert the project from its construction financing into its permanent financing. Uh -huh. Um, so okay. typically that will take a, a year after the project is fully leased up and um, complete. Um, and so we ask for that five-year um, delegation. Thank you. That's very helpful. I should have asked that maybe 100 votes ago. So thank you. <laughs> All right. And with that satisfaction with the answer, is there a motion in there, Supervisor Chavez? I was going to let Supervisor Ellenberg do this. <laughs> and she worked with the community. And I'll make a second. That's really happy to, to move this forward. Thank you, Consuelo. Thank second. you. Motion by Vice President Ellenberg, second by Chavez. Seeing no other hands raised. Nancy, will you please call for the vote? Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you, Nancy. We now move on to item number 10, keeping Consuelo here with us. I'm gonna open the public hearing and once again, receive any testimony from anyone of the public wishing to do so. And I see one hand raised, Nancy. Next speaker is Alex Shore. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Just wanted to note that these initial ground lease terms have these options of extending both on this item and the previous item. And our Catalyze this Dispute members didn't have a chance to score this project from Danko Communities, but have scored another one that the county has been supportive of and has helped fund and want to affirm that support. And also just affirm that I think our members would be really excited to see these options for renewing the ground lease extended beyond the 55 years. I think that's a, a great way to guarantee affordable housing for more years. So kudos to the county and your development partners for looking to build this affordable housing to exist longer for our community. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Um, hi, my name is Catherine Hedges, 11 District 2, and I'm also a member of Catalyze SV. Um, and I echo everything Alex said. And I also want to say I'm really glad that the county is doing a ground lease rather than selling the public land the way San Jose has been doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. So we've opened public hearing. We've received testimony. I'm now closing public hearing. Closing the public hearing. <sighs> Those three bags of m and got to kick in quickly. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Thank you. I, I did have a question for Consuelo on this. And, um, and what I was interested in better understanding is that um, what happened relative to, to the Danco company um, having to change the project relative to low-income housing tax credits. And I'm just wondering how they had to change it to be more competitive. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I will note that the developer applied five times for tax credits. Um, and we got together with the City of San Jose Housing Department, the Housing Authority, to come up with different scenarios that would ultimately keep the project intact in what we had shared with the community before and what the entitlements uh, were approved for. 
Um, and ultimately, the project is still considered a special needs project by tax credit requirements. Um, and we're leveraging 50% of the units with housing vouchers for households that are at risk of homelessness and the balance of the units for our rapid rehousing program participants. But well, I guess what I'm trying to understand, Consuelo, how was this project not competitive? I, I guess I'm not understanding if the intent, I don't know. I, I, I'm just perplexed and want to better understand understand that. I didn't get it from the report. Yeah, apologies, Supervisor Chavez. All, a lot of our projects are not competitive because of the cost of construction. Our region, unfortunately, if you're not in a specific area where you get bonus points for disadvantaged areas, we compete statewide for tax credits. There's a small geographic portion, and then you have to compete within different categories, large family, special needs, and it's highly competitive. Most recently, there's an accelerator program with three of our projects moving forward. And then in December, we have seven projects that will possibly be funded with tax credits. So new money coming in makes our projects more competitive. But we see Supervisor Chavez sometimes 15 or 16 applications with the same score. Wow. Wow. So the changing it up what made it more competitive? And so the change, what made it more competitive? Maybe I didn't it, answer. Sure. What made it more competitive is it that it went from the way that the state classifies special needs being 100% special needs versus 50% special needs. Got it. All right. Well, thank you for that. No other hands raised. Supervisor Chavez, do you wish to make the motion this time? I'll let, I'll go behind Supervisor Ellenberg again. Go ahead, Susan. <laughs> Happy to go either way, but I will will move approval on this second D4 project today. Thank you. Second, Chavez. Thank you. Thank you. Motion by, by Vice President Ellenberg, second by Chavez. No other hands raised. Nancy, please call the vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. yes. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Present. Aye. There we go. <laughs> That's the third <laughs> Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Supervisor Committee, and the secret is to buy more little bags of M&Ms at Halloween than what you might need. And then you have ones left over, but you didn't buy them for yourself. You bought them for others. So it's a, a no guilt kind of thing. The ghost of Supervisor Yeager hangs heavily over our office that I would never never encourage such behavior, even if I might indulge from time to time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, that was item 10. Item 11 was is being held to January 11th, 2022 at 2 p.m. Item 12 is also being held to January 11th, 2022 at 2 p.m. Item 13 regarding redistricting is to be heard no earlier than 2 p.m., which is three hours from now, so we will do that then. We now turn to item 14. Let me just flip my binder over to item 14. And Supervisor Simidian, uh, regarding the Mental Health Systems Navigator Program, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, I will just move the recommended action. If I, there is a second, I will then speak briefly. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, this is a notion that um, had been rattling around in the back of my head for some time. And I, um, it, it, I became more and more convinced at the need for what I've characterized as a mental health uh, systems navigator as we had the conversations in the community around AOT, assisted outpatient treatment, also known as Laura's Law. And I, I think, you know, all of us who have worked in this uh, arena on mental health issues know the pain and the anguish that people feel when they are at, you know, wit's end trying to access the system, which can be complicated and confusing and bureaucratic in spite of our best efforts that involves not just our own county organization, but our uh, partners in the community and uh, private sector who provide services as well. Um, tragically, I had a phone call just a week ago from someone who 
I desperately needed help. And I ended up being the informal navigator on a Friday night uh, with the help, I should say, of our behavioral health staff. Thank you again to them. But it, it was so poignant to me because it was a reminder of just how challenging uh, this arena can be uh, when all of a sudden, or maybe over an extended period of time, there's a moment when someone needs help is um, perhaps less able than ever to ask for that help and is confronting a very challenging system, if a system it is. So very simply, the recommended action is to ask our administration to report back to us in three months with option for the creation of a mental health systems navigator program. The only thing I want to be clear about is I want these to be dedicated resources specific to the navigator function, not service providers, because I worry that uh, service provision will always crowd out the assistance that I'm hoping a navigator or navigator function can provide. So again, uh, thank you. And the only other thing I would say, Mr. Chair, is I know we had some late arriving letters. So colleagues, if you haven't seen them, I would turn your attention to the letters of support for which I say thank you from the Children's Health Council, Momentum Health, Behavioral Health Contractors Association, uh, folks at uh, NAMI as well, uh, cutting uh, Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County, uh, the Macon Community Center and Aki. Thank you to them for the work they do, but also thank you for their support. I was pleased to see that they share the view that this is a, uh, a really uh, helpful step if we uh, can uh, move it along. Thank you. I'll second it. You, you may have my second, Supervisor Lee. I, I seconded already. I'm giving it oh, over I'm sorry. to you. That's, that's okay. I've had years of seconds. You're just starting on seconds. <laughs> so did you have further comment to make before we uh, turn to our public? Supervisor Lee? Nope. Nope. I think, okay, uh, Supervisor, Supervisor Chavez. Chavez. said it best. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. I think you all wait till after the public and then if you could come back to me. Thank you. Nancy. How much time would you like us to allow? Uh, a minute each is fine. Perfect. First speaker is Mary Gloner. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. Thank you, President Wasserman, the Board of Supervisors, and especially to you, Supervisor Simeon, for continuing to be our behavior health champion. My name is Mary Gloner. I'm the CEO for Project Safety Net, but I'm a community health educator at heart. As we all know, patient navigation has been essential, especially like promotoras, lay health workers, community health outreach workers, effective in navigating primary care, whether it's HIV, AIDS, diabetes, breast and cervical care, and women's health. And as a person who has um, health experience, I know, and many of my colleagues, the challenge of navigating a healthcare system. And so can you only imagine our, our general community that don't have resources and access? So very excited uh, for this uh, to really look at the whole um, well-being and we'll be there to support um, this effort to make it possible for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. The next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm a resident of Just Route 2, and um, I am completely unable to navigate any kind of health system related to the county. Um, I have been trying to get treatment for a specific medical problem that is covered by Medicare since May, and I've been given all kinds of wrong referrals to places say, oh, well, if you have, you know, they'll keep me waiting for months, say, oh, well, if you have Medicare, you're not eligible. And then another place, they've been telling me, oh, we'll talk about that next week for months and months. And finally, I had a meeting with the boss like, no, we cannot give you a referral for this health problem. Well, then why have I been going here for four months? And it's a total mess. We need this not just for mental health, although that's extremely valuable, but we need it for physical health care too. Um, Valley Med is utterly unhelpful if patients have anything serious. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. I'll turn now to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I wanted to say um, a, 
um, thank you to Supervisor Simidian for bringing this forward. And just two requests, um, if you're comfortable with this, uh, Supervisor Simidian. One is that um, I am I'm very interested in us streamlining streamlining lining. Sorry, God, Mike, I've been spending too much time with you this morning. Streamlining um, our um, our phone numbers uh, because. The, the number of numbers you have to call to get uh, information is um, is very overwhelming, especially in the mental health space. And so I, I just wanna reinforce for staff that in addition to looking at navigators that we concurrently have to look at how to make the system easier to access because frankly, we shouldn't need nav navigators. Um, in some instances, I think we, would need advocates because you know this, the the issues are complicated. But but I really want to see us um, moving to reducing the number of, of phone numbers that one has to call to get help. At, concurrent to looking at this, how how do we simplify the system? Um, and then the other thing I'll just add is that you know the county has been working on the child diagnostic center for a while, and a core component of that diagnostic center is to make sure that we have um, advocates. And when the report comes back on, on um, this, I just would wanna better understand from staff, their understanding of a, a navigator versus an advocate, or if in some ways that is seen as similar. Um, I am happy to incorporate I am happy to incorporate both requests in the motion, but with the caveat that I do not want those two additional requests to delay the report back or action on the pure navigator program. I certainly support um, anything we can do to simplify the system. Uh, and um, I think it is important to understand and be clear about the distinction between an advocate and a navigator. But right now, what I'm asking for and I'm hoping I get um, support for is a clear path forward for a navigator program that comes back to us from staff in three months. And I, and I don't want, uh, and if, if there's any delay colleagues on those other two items, uh, I don't want that to delay the uh, report back and uh, with options for action. Uh, on the navigator. With that understanding, happy to incorporate it. And Supervisor Chavez, uh, as you were speaking, I just recall a, a favorite quote from the late Walter Cronkite broad broadcaster back in the day, uh, who uh, you may have heard me reference before, who said, I don't know why we call it a healthcare system. It isn't healthy, it isn't caring, and it sure as hell isn't a system. And um, I, I just, you know, we struggle with that so often in spite of people's best efforts and attention. So um, I am uh, fully supportive of anything we can do to simplify the system, but I think we're going to need navigators for a long time to come, uh, as much as I wish I didn't have to say that. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, you are not in agreement? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, you have a second. You agree with what the first just said? Absolutely. Thank and I think it's definitely time. I thank a supervisor submitting and false leadership for putting this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I call for the vote, the navigator word, supervisor submitting, and I thought was a great word. I recently went through a system with uh, Medicare regarding the D card for prescriptions for my mother. And it was extremely frustrating over the number of days. And a navigator through our mental health system I think will be a wonderful addition to our mental health system. I will also say our system, while, while it might be complicated for the public to get to where they want to get, I think a navigator will help make that easier. I think that's great. But I will say, I think our system as a whole medically is absolutely fantastic and fabulous once you get into it. The services that are provided by the Santa Clara County Medical Health System are, I think, world-class. And I know my fellow supervisors agree, that's not the issue being addressed here. The issue is how do you navigate to get to where you want to go? And Supervisor Smitty and I echo what Supervisor Lee said, thank you for bringing this 
to a formal action. I think this will benefit a lot of people probably forever. Uh, with that, Nancy, I'll call for the vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? I'm sorry, Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. We now go to item 15, which is our report from our county exec, Dr. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. I wanted to speak a little bit today about the uh, COVID outbreak at our jail system. You've uh, heard from us a number of times about a significant outbreak. Um, we're now uh, counting about 154 uh, inmates uh, who have been positive. Um, we have uh, initiated with the help of the courts and the DA and the public defender efforts to release as many um, inmates that are at risk or positive as possible. Um, we're continuing to do that. We're also isolating uh, uh, positive inmates and uh, separating uh, individuals who have come in contact with positive cases. Um, and we're uh, keeping close track of their symptoms. Uh, at this point, uh, that's pretty much all I can give you as an update. So with that, I'll end my report. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I've got a question for you and then Super Supervisor Smith, you go ahead first. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, you and I spoke yesterday uh, afternoon, and I indicated that I had just learned that our county was um, making arrangements for vaccination uh, visits to um, uh, schools throughout the county. Uh, my understanding is there are 97 such visits and vaccination efforts uh, scheduled for the months of November and December. Uh, at 50 schools, if I am correctly informed. Uh, I am also informed, however, that those 97 visits at 50 schools include not a single school in the 5th Super Resorial District. Do you have a comment on that? That's zero out of 97 visits, as I understand it. Yeah, I um, can give you a general update, and then we have a representative from um, public health for further detail. The general update was that the decisions to rank um, schools into two levels, level one and level two, was based on their perceived risk. And it was done using uh, zip codes. And as we know from our experience with uh, COVID uh, process and particularly the statewide disparity efforts that if you use zip codes, you get a much different outlook than if you use uh, census tracts or districts or any other boundary. So in summation, um, it was an attempt to try to focus on high risk areas. It was a mistake. We we're trying to fix the uh, equity at this point. And uh, if you have further questions, I think Dr. Uh, Sarah Cody is online to give you some more detail. I think what I will do, Mr. Chairman, is um, in respect to the Brown Act, since this is not an agendized item at our meeting, um, I will just indicate that the notion that 97 visits at 50 schools would include not a single school in um, one fifth of the county uh, with 400,000 folks and probably more than 50,000 young people um, is a notion I find wholly unacceptable. Um, I, I will let it go at that, given the fact that this is not an agendized item, but I will note that we have a regularly scheduled meeting of our health and hospital committee uh, tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock. Um, we will, of course, be getting our uh, routine monthly report on COVID matters at that time. And so I would just ask that Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody be ready to discuss the issue more fully at that time and hopefully offer some 
uh, path forward uh, that uh, is acceptable uh, and um, appropriate. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm very sure that at the meeting tomorrow, the two doctors will have a list of the other schools in District 5 that will be on the schedule. Supervisor yeah. Chavez, you were next. I'm Supervisor sorry, Dr. Lee. Dr. Smith, go ahead. I'm just saying we'll fix it. Yep, I, I figured as much. Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Uh, Supervisor Lee was before me. Oh, go ahead, this point, Cindy. Um, you know, what I what I was going to ask, I was actually going to ask you this, Chair, is when when are we hearing um, uh, COVID-19 back on our with our full board again? I have not discussed that with administration. Um, I'll be happy to do that later this week, and uh, we can add it on for the next agenda if you'd like. I would, and the reason is that um, I think that these discussions are really very important and should be discussed by the full board. And um, and I appreciate that committees are great to dive in deep, um, but I think on issues like this, and especially as, you know, because I think we're gonna have a little more results about who's getting vaccinated and from from where, um, that, that ha having a strong understanding of that information will be very important as the board makes decisions for future resources. So I really wanna encourage us to hear it at, at the uh, next meeting if we can. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly very disconcerting to see the uh, outbreak uh, from the jail this time uh, and again, and we've had quite a few of these. Uh, so I, I'm just trying to ask uh, Dr. Smith, what type of additional strategies we can do in terms of trying to vaccinate uh, both the, those incarcerated and also the correctional officers because the data we've been receiving is that that's actually one group uh, of folks who have been lacking on, on, on getting the vaccination. And then the other question is regarding the booster shots. Now that we're giving all booster shots 18 and above, what are we also pushing forward on that as well in the incarcerated uh, a setting. So if we could get some type of, um, um, uh, it could be off agenda, it could be verbal, report back to us. I certainly would appreciate it of what we are doing to try to uh, get that under control. Um, second issue is regarding um, the South County uh, vaccinations. I know we do have Monday through Friday, uh, but apparently there's no weekend um, uh, county uh, vaccination uh, uh, being a, a, available for some of some South County residents. And given the need right now, uh, I was just at a uh, uh, site uh, this Saturday in, in, uh, in Sunnyvale uh, in the mobile home park, and it was extreme, extremely popular. There was a line around the corner, uh, parents bring their kids, the parents getting the booster shot, the kids getting the first shot, five to 11. It's really a great, uh, great scene on weekends. So I do think weekends are a really good place to outreach. And so we also know that uh, Gilroy is certainly is one location where the, the uh, a number of uh, vaccinations uh, are, are lower and also some of the case rates early on. So I would just want to ask if we could uh, ask public health to see if they can deploy some resources to uh, Gilroy and Morgan Hill uh, on the weekends. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And before Dr. Smith, I recognize you. Supervisor Chavez, one correction I should make is that we currently have the COVID report scheduled for every other board meeting because that's that's where we are. So it's already scheduled for the next meeting. And thank I appreciate you. Dr. Smith saying, telling me that. Dr. Smith, did you have additional comments? Well, I was going to make that clear, but then um, I also will address uh, Supervisor Lee's um, concern. Um, we um, do have uh, resources for vaccination in South County. Yep. Um, we are planning to increase the availability there. So we'll give you an off agenda about times and amounts and dates and all of that because I don't have those off the top of my head. But we'll do that to the board off agenda. In terms of uh, the question about boosters, we are uh, giving boosters to anybody who is an adult who's received their completed series uh, in the appropriate time period, which is six months um, after their last uh, shot. And uh, we'll, we're doing that countywide. 
Yep. And just for general information, we're also having significant success with uh, uh, juvenile in shots over the last couple of days. It's been in the tooth range. Um, so that's a good thing. And we're seeing participation from the uh, community um, physicians also, as well as our close partners and community clinics. So we'll give you more detail about that uh, on and off agenda. Thank you. Yes, the response countywide for children and unvaccinated adults or adults getting booster shots has been absolutely tremendous. It started off with that kickoff where we did 14,000 kids over the second weekend, which was amazing. And we have numbers coming from all of our partners. I see people lined up at pharmacies. I hear about people at Stanford, Kaiser, everywhere else as well. The response from the residents of Santa Clara County is enormous, meeting this third metric. And I'm very excited to hear at our next meeting about uh, if we've reached all three metrics and, and ending the masking. Um, Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still up. Did you have another comment? I just wanted to ask a follow-up question, um, um, Dr. Smith, as it relates to the jails. And that is that I was curious about the vaccination rates of our, our staff that are in the jails, if, if you know the answer to that. I don't know the exact number right offhand. I know we were having some significant problems with uh, encouraging correctional deputies to get vaccinated. However, with the deadline that came up on November 1st, uh, we did have a rush of individuals getting vaccination and we're working through the reasonable accommodation process uh, for those individuals who've made a um, request for a waiver. Um, I can get you the numbers uh, later on in the meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. That would be great for both the sheriffs and the um, uh, and the and our correctional deputies. Thank you very much. Vice Thank President you. Allenberg. Oh, sorry. One other thing, just as a follow up, uh, the immunization rate for inmates is challenging to keep track of because we have. Um, quite a bit of churn of low level individuals. Um, and so our rates really are uh, changing on a day to day, moment to moment basis, depending on new bookings and new discharges. Um, but for those individuals who are admitted, uh, everyone is offered an opportunity to be vaccinated. Um, we obviously can't force them to be vaccinated and we're focused on um, the individuals um, who have either long sentences or have been with us for quite some time to make sure we um, get as many of those individuals vaccinated as possible. It's much harder to deal with the individuals who are gone in a week. I think the board knows that um, well over 80% of our um, clients are released uh, within two weeks of having been booked. So that makes it a challenging thing to get them vaccinated within two weeks. Thank you. Vice President Allenberg. Thanks so much. I want to um, just just stay with the, the custody COVID concerns for a moment. Uh, Dr. Smith, you, you mentioned, I think in response to Supervisor Lee, that there's uh, some collaboration happening between the district attorney and the courts and probation around increasing that pretrial release. Is there a, a formalized plan or who would be the right, um, well, I'll just a a ask you if the board could get uh, an off agenda report on what that collaboration looks like and what the what the criteria are or the plan is for, for um, expediting or expanding the release. Yes, we can certainly get to the details. Um, it's actually not, we're also, well, let me back up. I wasn't specifically referring to pretrial release. I was talking about um, release of current inmates. And basically um, what we're doing is working with the DA and the courts and the public defender to identify 
individuals who are close to the end of their sentence or who for other reasons can easily be released um, and uh, releasing them as quickly as possible. It's uh, quite labor intensive and I certainly can give you an off agenda with more details uh, that will help. At the same time, we are trying to maximize the pretrial release in addition and maximize our pretrial efforts to keep individuals out of the justice system right. as much as possible. So it's on both sides of the process. Thank you so much for that. So much of my attention has been focused on the, the pretrial, but it's interesting to hear that there's a good number of um, people post-conviction who can be, you said, easily and safely released. Certainly we should be doing this for COVID purposes, but I would also like to think that well beyond the pandemic and separate from it, if there are people in our system, in our custody, who can be easily and safely released, that should certainly be the normative practice. Yes, I would agree. And I think we'll delve into that quite a bit more in January on the 11th when we talk about trying to maximize our efforts to both keep people away from the justice system, get them out of it as quickly as possible. As you know, you and I have talked about how we could um, create a continuum of care that really maximizes our efforts to keep people away from the justice system. Mm -hmm. system basis. And it will require um, quite a bit of cooperation from the courts and the DA and the public defender and, and police, but uh, we'll make it happen. Absolutely, looking forward to that conversation. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, your hand's still raised. Did you have another comment? Uh, yes, I do. A uh, couple of things. <laughs> One is, I guess, with Dr. Smith is uh, when you say folks coming and booking, uh, we cannot force anybody to uh, get vaccinated, but I'm not sure if that's a question that's being asked is whether they are vaccinated or not. Certainly anywhere you go to these days, uh, people are checking our vaccination status. So if at booking, I hope they do ask that question. Number one, if they are not, then absolutely make it very easy uh, available so that they could actually get the least to vaccination or boosters. So I just want to add that as something that if that's something that is feasible to do, I think it will be a great opportunity to get more people uh, vaccinated, number one. Number two is about the Johnson Johnson outreach. Uh, unfortunately, the so-called one and done does not seem to work as well as based on the data. Uh, and I just want to know if we are keeping track of any of those Johnson Johnson vaccinated individuals and if we're actually able to outreach to them to let them know that they could get their uh, boosters uh, ASAP and they don't need to wait six months. It's off confusion on the date, like two months, six months, whatever. But practically, from my understanding, if you've gotten your Johnson Johnson, you practically can get your boosters only after two months. Um, and the fact that they can get any uh, other type of uh, uh, boosters like Moderna or Pfizer as well. So I just want to check to see if there's any efforts in that regard. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, go ahead and answer those. Okay, well, the first question about booking, yes, everyone's asked when they come into booking whether they've been vaccinated or not. And, and if they have not been, they're offered the um, opportunity to be vaccinated immediately. Of course, that would be just the first dose, but yes, we are doing that. Um, in terms of the question about Johnson & Johnson in the general community, we're trying to encourage people who have Receive Johnson and Johnson to go ahead and get Moderna or um, mm -hmm. Pfizer um, and do a series, um, and that's certainly in the communication. We have not um, created a system to find individuals with Johnson and Johnson to notify them, but we are doing outreach. All right. Yeah. yeah, if there's anything like an email records of uh, individuals got Johnson Johnson, that would be a fairly uh, low cost and easy way to outreach to them. So I just want to see if this is something that's feasible. If you could look at that, uh, Dr. Smith, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I think everybody is aware right now the why booster is so important is because it turns out these vaccines do wane, right? We have waning problems. So 
after six months, eight months or so, uh, the vaccines are not as powerful or strong as they used to be, the 90 odd percent that we've been advertising, right, for Pfizer and Moderna. So, um, and, and with the uh, pending winter that we're seeing, uh, if you look at the map of the United States, all the outbreaks currently are all in the northern part of our, in the central part of our country, which shows that weather, uh, colder weather certainly is a big factor uh, on how active COVID is. And now that folks are having waning immunity, the, 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 the boosters are here. So it is so important to get people out there. And frankly, many people who've been vaccinated two times, fully vaccinated, I think is developing this like a cause a false sense of security. Uh, so I think there's actually quite a bit of work we need to do to get people understanding the importance of getting boosters. Thank you, Doc Smith. Thank you, and that nope, Supervisor Chavez. Thanks, and I, Dr. Smith, you may have answered this and I missed it, but does that mean for folks who are in custody now um, that we have a plan for booster shots, especially those who have been long-term with us and also flu shots? And if, if not, um, perhaps at the committee tomorrow, you could talk a little bit about how you see that unfolding. Yes, we already have a plan for uh, booster shots and we always uh, do uh, flu shots um, for inmates who are with us for a significant period of time or who are due for their boosters. But we can explain that some more in the health and hospital. But yes, we do that. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great just to get the timeline tomorrow. Thank you. Dr. Smith, I'll just close with, you know, you're mentioning 80% of the people there, I think you said we're only there for a couple of weeks. And with not being able to force a vaccine upon people, um, you've got people coming in, going, spreading the vaccine or contract, excuse me. I'm sorry. Spreading the virus or contracting the virus. I think it's under you. And that's really problematic. And hearing 154 people have it right now, that's problematic not being able to isolate each and every person because of not enough room, that's problematic. Um, you're dealing with a huge issue and I appreciate the fact that each and every person who walks through those doors is asked if they've been vaccinated and if it's been the sufficient amount of time asked if they want a booster and if they haven't been vaccinated, asked if they want a vaccine right there. That's, that's all that we can do per the law. So thank you for that. With that, board members, I'm going to turn to our county counsel, James Williams, for a report of uh, his department in closed session. There are no reportable actions taken at the closed session of November 15th, 2021. That concludes my report. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is up. Was that for Dr. Smith or is that for James? No, you were just waving at me? Okay. All right, that was item 16. We now move on to item 17. We should have our CEO of the hospital, Paul Lorenz here for a monthly report on our Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. Good morning, oh. President uh, Wasserman and members of the board. Good morning. Um, I have three points, all of which is uh, included in your written report. Uh, the first is the quality metrics that are reported quarterly to your board. Uh, we are seeing improvement in the colorectal cancer screening. Um, as well as in the diabetes area. Uh, we are focused on depression um, and we do have uh, what I believe a clear, clear path forward to improve those uh, screening metrics, if you will. SB 1152, your board did request an update on how we're performing relative to that regulatory requirement. Um, this is the requirement that we document not only homelessness, but also the medical uh, care provided and support services such as medication, uh, meals, transportation, and clothing. Uh, since we've implemented a new workflow utilizing EPIC, our HealthLink EHR, uh, we are seeing significant improvements at all three hospitals in terms of our compliance. Uh, then with respect to medical respite, your board did ask for an update on the number of referrals coming from hospitals. Uh, clearly, Valley Medical Center and O'Connor are the top referrals. Uh, uh, coming into medical respite. Um, at this point in time, we have about 10 to 15 clients in our medical respite at any given time. Uh, the, I think the important thing to note on these numbers is that these numbers are lower than, uh, lower 
in terms of prior reporting periods. Uh, much of that is due to COVID, where the other hospitals have uh, reduced the number of elective cases that they were doing. Uh, but we are seeing numbers increasing in terms of the referrals coming into the medical respite program. Uh, with that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding the report. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, I see your hand raised. We also have a speaker. Would you like to speak before the speaker or after the speaker? I'm happy to wait until after the speaker. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, same question to you after the speaker. Nancy, would you please allow our speakers in? Yes. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. May I uh, speak on the last item? There was no public comment on it. Uh, there, there is no public comment, Paul, on either the uh, CEO or the county council. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, well, then, with respect to with respect to this item, and I'm just I'm very concerned about equity in the way that we are uh, trying to apply that principle with respect to the allocation of resources and and uh, uh, decisions within the departments. I think that th it was a perfect example that was given by uh, Supervisor Submidian that 57 schools had received vaccinations for children, but the East Side was like left out of that. I mean, this is, these are, these are like serious, serious problems that need to be corrected. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting. Uh, thanks for this item. I just wanted to um, try to remind uh, the, the ideas of uh, the importance of mask use coming up at this holiday time. And um, that it's quite possible that, uh, you know, we could have a rise in COVID cases again uh, this winter. Um, good luck. I, you know, I'm trying to learn the language of, of, try to, of trying to ask how we can uh, prepare ourselves. Uh, how can we talk about the future of the, of the vaccine process and, and what it's about? Uh, it's lifestyle choices that it can offer ourselves and, and what we'll be living with. Uh, I hope we can consider that as we're uh, introducing the vaccine process to children at this time and that we can consider the open technology, open public policies with technology practices uh, that can help uh, offer good conversations for this subject matter. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy, I appreciate that. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul, thanks for the report and particularly for the efforts uh, to improve the reporting of supports provided to patients under the SB 1152 requirements. From the additional data that you now have available on patient acceptance of supports and staff screening of patient needs, do you know if the BHHP team has identified areas for continued effort to get to that goal of 100% compliance with screening? Supervisor Ellenberg, so what we know now relative to just the compliance of documenting the interaction with the, place, uh, the patient is that we do have to spend more time with staff educating them regarding asking the questions and also obviously the follow through. So that is where our focus will be with ED staff at all three hospitals, um, really um, making sure they understand the importance of it in, in terms of support of the clients. Um, and now that we have the ability to clearly document on a regular basis, you know, clearly that's gonna improve our compliance, but we really want to get to really the uh, the compassionate part of this legislation is making sure that the patients get the support they need. Uh, many times when the patient is identified as homeless and they're not known within our system, they, the ED staff will reach out to the homeless program to make that warm handoff to ensure that they get to ongoing support. Thanks, I, I appreciate the connection of, of data uh, with compassion and I'll look forward to continued progress um, in providing supports to patients um, in, the, in the next quarterly report. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I was curious, uh, particularly as it relates to COVID um, shots and flu shots, whether or not the um, 
the, the team that focuses on the homeless community also um, goes into our newer um, housing developments where we have lots of clients for this particular service. So wherever the homeless program goes and frequents, they will offer and educate the clients relative to the COVID vaccine, um, as well as the flu shot availability. And so do we, do they currently go to, um, you know, to Second Street Studios or to the Kirtner Studios? Do you know if that's an area we currently set up in? Provider, I think it's best that I get back to you on okay. this and make sure that we identify the frequency for that. Uh, and also visit. whether or not yeah. folks, if they are, if the reason I'm asking is that we have some folks who are, um, who are, who are relatively, relatively recently homeless who are moving into facilities that are just learning how to use the healthcare system overall. And we have a lot of folks who are homeless who, um, who, who seem to be around some of these facilities. And so anyway, I was just wondering how that gets handled from, from your shop and whether or not they make appointments to provide services. And in particular, I'm interested in Renaissance Place, but there may be others that your staff is already working at. So that would be great if, if someone could just let us know and shoot us all, all a quick email, it'd be great. We, we will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, the, the uh... To update is uh, very uh, encouraging. I would like to know if you could maybe walk us through uh, on how this discharge process works because clearly, uh, you no know, offered a meal is great, prescribed medication and transportation, uh, uh, and you know, the weather appropriate clothing, all those is good. But my bigger concern is uh, if they go back to the creek to sleep or whatever. Uh, that's going to exacerbate the health condition. So it certainly is not a place to recover. My question is, how does that hook up to our VI SPDET program and whether or not we will be able to give them some type of temporary interim housing with OSH or even uh, motel rooms uh, for those who have you know, recently discharged? Um, if you could give me some um, visibility on how that program works, I really appreciate it. Sure, Supervisor Lee. Um, so first of all, when an individual presents to the ED, um, large percentage of time, these are individuals that we are aware of uh, that are homeless and utilize our system. Um, and under the requirement, we're required to document reg the regulation. We're required to document, obviously we know they're homeless, but also the, all the support services that are identified in the, in the regulation, which I've, I've identified in the report. Um, and whether or not they've accepted that support or not. Um, for individuals that present to the ED that are being discharged outside of these types of support services that we offer, we do focus on their housing situation. Um, if we know that number one, that they're new to the system and that they're homeless, we work very hard uh, to connect them to the homeless program and the office of support of housing for additional follow-up. Um, regarding their housing situation. Um, so we, we try as much as possible anytime they present to our ED to not only offer the support services relative to the identified areas within the regulation, but also re regarding their homeless status and whether or not we can assist in that regard. Um, so again, it, it, it is a warm handoff as much as possible relative to them wanting the support uh, that we're offering or needing the support. Do you track uh, whether they are going to go back and house the children versus what they're going to have at least a uh, room over the head upon discharge? Something we keep track of? We, we try to um, document their, their situation relative to their housing circumstances. Um, if, in fact, they've been uh, gone through a procedure or a treatment at the hospital, whether uh, directly from the ED or um, being discharged from the inpatient unit, we do make a referral to the respite program to ensure that they have adequate time to recover from their procedure or uh, their particular medical condition. Um, so that link is also there relative to um, interim support um, regarding the housing need.
Now I'm unmuted. All right. I think. Yes, I don't see any more from Supervisor Lee. Thank you very much. Do you need a motion to receive the report? Yes, I'm going to go. No. no, we don't. Okay. We don't need to see receive a report related to. No, we don't need a motion for that, but they do have um, possible actions. Approve the report, approve the quarterly update, approve the quarterly grant budget update. So we do have three actions that I need a motion for. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Motion by Supervisor Chavez. Second, I believe, was Supervisor Lee. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. We have a motion. We have a second. No further discussion. Nancy, the vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. With that, we move on to item number 19 which is our regarding our health coverage expansion supervisor submitting thank you uh, mr chair as you know this item came through our health and hospital committee uh it was the unanimous recommendation of our committee that means supervisor lee and myself to uh, recommend that we proceed with option three so uh i want to offer that as a motion at this time if there's a second i will speak briefly Thank you, Supervisor Lee. I'll be second. Thank you. And then uh, I should just say um, uh, a shout out to Supervisor Chavez who raised this issue in the context of a possible pilot a while back. And I, I asked at the time that we hold off uh, in the hope that we could uh, do uh, the 400% model for uh, uh, the entire county. That uh, seems entirely practicable uh, and I'll just point out that uh, when I came back on the board in 2013 and Supervisor Chavez joined the board shortly thereafter, uh, we had more than 200,000 folks in our county who were uninsured. Uh, and uh, we have managed to more than cut that uh, by half. Uh, the um, combination of the Medi-Cal expansion, Covered California, Affordable Care Act, and our own Valley Health Plan with aggressive outreach and marketing uh, means that the number of uninsured is probably closer to 80,000 today. But that's still 80,000 folks who frankly need our help and uh, increasing the uh, eligibility criteria to our federal poverty limit of 400 uh, rather than 200% uh, in the estimation of staff means we could probably reach more than 20,000 folks with accessible and affordable health care. So uh, a really good day's work if we can do it. So uh, I'll stop there uh, in the interest of time and uh, hope Hope we get a unanimous high vote today. Thank you very much. I'll be supporting it as well. After this item, staff and members, um, we are going to break for lunch. Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised before I turn to the public. Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, I would like to thank staff for providing information on these options for the PCAP expansion and like to express my enthusiasm supporting this expansion to 400% of the FPL, the, the federal poverty level. The primary care access program, PCAP, has been closing the gaps in care and coverage for neighbors who do not qualify for Medi-Cal or covered California. Let's take an average family of four to illustrate an example. With the current PCAP model, a family of four making less than $53,000 would be eligible for the services. However, what we are voting on today by proposing the expansion to this 400% federal property level, that would allow a family of four making less than $106,000 to be eligible for services. This expansion would double the income requirement for PCAP. And this is going to be a game changer because of, if adopted, this program will more than triple, triple the number of Santa Clara County residents currently available to be served through PCAP. And I'd like to recognize all of our friends from the uh, CC Puerto Collective who have attended meetings and spoken in support of PCAP. And I hope that we'll be able to expand not just access to PCAP, but see more services included, such as mental health, dental, and vision. Finally, as we all know, we do not have universal health care in this country. And this is one of the ways that our county can do as fast as we can to offer as much uh, coverage as possible to our residents. Thank you, and I hope we get your support. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Like I said, I'll be expressing two. 
but we have one speaker, Nancy. Yes. Oh, excuse me, Nancy, excuse me one second. Dr. Smith, do you have a comment? Um, I just wanted to, for the public's information, make the point that uh, this program really focuses on services provided by our core partners, which are the community clinics, and making sure that <clears throat> access is available to all patients up to 400% uh, percent of poverty to be seen by the community clinics. Uh, we at BMC and through all of our clinics also have an access program, but it's a separate program. So this really is uh, focusing on allowing the community clinics to expand their services as well as our BMC clinics. Super, thank you. Nancy. Next speaker is Gabriel Hernandez. I am unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yes. Yes, yes so Gabriel Hernandez, director for the CISA Puede Collective. Um, I want to thank um, Supervisor Chavez for uplifting the work of our essential workers in the East Side San Jose doing the work in addressing the pandemic and the lack of health coverage for uh, some of them. Also, thank you to Supervisors Simidian and Lee for the work in the Health and Hospital Committee and the years of the review of the uh, PCAP and, and Supervisor Simidian, uh, thank you for the proposal to expand this coverage to an additional 20,000 families. This is an ongoing cost and cannot, and cannot go unnoticed. And the CISA Puede Collective was happy to participate in the meetings to make a little history with you. This is a big deal. Finally, we would like you to, uh, to urge all of the supervisors to support the health clinics requests like Gardner Health Clinic that provides these type of services to improve their reimbursement formula so that they can continue, continue to afford providing these health services to families like ours. Uh, thank you for making a little his history, and this changes the lives of our families in many ways. Thank you. Good timing on your speech, Gabrielle. All right. <laughs> Next speaker is Claudia Damiani. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Claudia. Claudia, oh, you may begin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Board of Supervisors. My name is Claudia Damiani. I'm the Program Director from Vegilution, and we are part of the CISA Puede Collective. Our advocacy and outreach work focuses on housing, immigration, childcare, leadership development, education, economic opportunities, environmental and food equity, and COVID-19 recovery efforts. On behalf of Vegilution and the CISA Puede Collective, I play a lead role in developing the strategy, curriculum development, and evaluation of our Jobs to Grow Mobility Labs program. I have learned firsthand from the more than 50 food service and childcare entrepreneurs we work with about the challenges of raising a family and finding stable employment, never mind access to affordable healthcare. We need to support to expand access to healthcare coverage, ensuring that thousands of our most vulnerable families, including many of of those that my team works with directly receive healthcare coverage. Thank you. Thank Next speaker is Casey Hill. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. I'm Casey Hill, executive director of Vegilution and a member of the CISE Puede Collective. I'm requesting that you support item 19, the healthcare expansion that will benefit families training to be employed or self-employed, including many members of the CISA Puede Collective. It has been clear that the COVID pandemic has hit low-income communities of color the hardest, exposing a number of inequities that our families in areas such as East San Jose and Gilroy have faced for years. We are asking you to support our ongoing work and strategies to uplift the contributions that our families have made to build and support these parts of the county. The crisis has pushed us all to be bold, innovative, and creative. This healthcare expansion is a perfect example. These family-first programs and policies do not work in isolation. They are part of a holistic approach to uplifting and protecting our families. Please support item number 19, and thank you. Thank you. And for any speakers listening, they keep adding on one at a time as they go down. Um, we have a motion. We have a second. I'm in favor as well. If you still wish to speak, please go right ahead. The next speaker is Brenda Arenas. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. 
Gracias, mi nombre es Brenda Arenas y soy un navegador comunitario de Girl Family Services y somos parte del colectivo Si Se Puede. Nuestra labor de defensa y divulgación se centra en la vivienda, las necesidades básicas, la inmigración, el cuidado de los niños, el desarrollo de, de liderazgo, la educación, las oportunidades económicas, la equidad, medio ambiente y alimentaria y los esfuerzos de recuperación del COVID-19. Este año el colectivo Si Se Puede ha puesto en marcha nuestro programa Trabajos para Crecer y Movilidad para enseñar a las familias a poner en marcha negocios en los ámbitos de la comida y el cuidado de los niños. Este trabajo ejemplifica cómo creamos oportunidades para que los miembros de nuestra comunidad puedan mantener a sus familias. Nuestros programas tienen impacto en Begrusion y Girl Family Services. Tenemos 50 familias aprendiendo cómo in iniciar sus negocios en el servicio de alimentos y servicios de cuidado de niños. Para ayudar a mejorar a las familias. Thank you. The live transcription wasn't able. Is that what you've got, Nancy? That was our final speaker. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. This is Mike, item. Mike, do we have the translation? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, do you need a translation? Thank you. I thought, never mind. I thought singing we had that going on at the same time. Go ahead, please. Okay. So my number is uh, Brenda Arenas. Um, and I'm a navigator and um, part of also for part of Si Se Puede Collectives, and we are helping families for delivering different services like housing, basic needs, um, food, children care, leadership, um, um, business opportunities, and also efforts, recovery efforts for COVID-19. We are part, as I said before, of Si Se Puede Collective, and we are working uh, with different families to enable them, to help them to enable the business focus on food and children. And we are creating econo um, economic opportunities. Um, and also we are helping families to start their businesses again for children and um, related to food. Super, thank you. Supervisor Chavez, thank you for the reminder. That concludes our speakers and our translation, Dr. Smith. When you get done with this vote, I'd like to make a little bit of an announcement. Okay, when we get done with this vote, Dr. Smith's gonna make an announcement, then we're gonna break for 30 minutes and I'll tell you what we're coming back to. Nancy, vote please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you, Nancy, Dr. Smith. Yes, supervisors, uh, you asked earlier about vaccine status for deputies and correctional officers. Let me just give you the numbers verbally. We'll put this in writing for you. So for correctional deputies, we have a total of 767 active deputies. Uh, 688 have been fully vaccinated, 21 partially vaccinated. 50 have pending exemptions um, for the uh, DSA, that's the deputy sheriffs, total of 396 active deputies, 345 are fully vaccinated, 50 are um, pending exemptions. So we're doing reasonably better than we have been there's always room for improvement. We'll put it all in the uh, off agenda and give you details, but since I promised to give you the details later in the meeting, this is later in the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Smith, I think that'll come out to about 90% have either been fully vaccinated or received at least their first shot. So as we'd all want it to be better, it's certainly better than the public, but we're all catching up. Let's get going, everybody. All right, it is now. 12:13. We are going to come back at 12:45. If you had a if you have a piece of paper and Nancy, please uh, confirm this when I'm done. This is what we're going to do. Item number 20, then 22, then 23, then 69, 70, 71 together, then 73, 74, and I'm hoping to have all that done 
by two o'clock, at which time we will hear item 13, which had a no sooner than two o'clock start. Nancy, how does that sound? That's what I have. Right on. All right, everybody. Have a good lunch. See you in 30. Recording stopped.